Well, I suppose we can start with your upbringing. So, you were born and raised in a country state in Norfolk before the Second World War as the daughter of two members of the nobility. So really, that's an upbringing that doesn't exactly exist anymore. Do you have fond memories of your childhood? And are there any particular memories that stand out? And particularly, what were your first memories of the Princess Margaret and Queen Elizabeth? Right, well, I'll start with myself, I think. Well, because when I was born, I was a big disappointment because I was a girl. And in those days, well, still, uh, there's primogenitor and women cannot inherit. Although the royal family have changed it. And if Princess Charlotte was the elder one, uh, she would be queen and Prince George wouldn't be king. Um, but the aristocracy haven't got round to sort of changing that. So I remember, uh, you know, from a very early age, that I was a big disappointment. And I remember saying, which is rather advanced actually for, for these days, I remember saying to my father, shall I have a sex change? With that, my, fa <laughs> my father said, I don't think that would help. <laughs> so, um, and my father was an equerry to the uh, Duke of York uh, before he became king. And as a result, my sister and I uh, met uh, the Queen, she was Princess Elizabeth then, and Princess Margaret Rose. And I suppose I was three when I first uh, met Princess Margaret, and I just knew she was going to be a friend. I, she was quite naughty, and so was I. And uh, we had these little tricycles, and we used to tricycle. I don't know if any of you have been to Holcombe, it's one of the stately homes, but it's got this wonderful marble hall. And Princess Margaret and I, we weren't allowed to. We used to love going in there and tricycling around. I remember doing that one day, and the Queen, who'd been playing with some other uh, friends, came down the steps and she looked at us and she said, Margaret, very, very naughty, and Anne too. And we screamed with laughter and sort of raced round and out of a door. So, um, you know, that, I suppose that was my first memory. And then I'll just tell you a story. We um, were always asked to Princess Margaret's and the Queen's uh, birthday parties and Christmas parties. And I remember going to Buckingham Palace and we went with our nannies. In those days they wore hats and gloves and, and uh, we were all in our little white frilly dresses and uh, silver shoes. And there's a story actually about silver shoes because there's a photograph of us. The Queen is looking at Princess Margaret in a rather suspicious way. And I said to her, what, ma'am, uh, why were you looking at my feet? And Princess Margaret said, well, you had silver shoes and I had uh, lace-up brown ones. I was so jealous. Anyway, we went to Buckingham Palace, uh, which was a wonderful tea, I remember. And then we had um, a Punch and Judy show, which actually Princess Margaret and I both agreed we were terrified of. Uh, Mr. Punch sort of beating his wife to frazzle. And then afterwards, we came down where there was a big table by the um, uh, fr front door of Buckingham Palace, and there were presents on them. And my sister rushed forward and got a sort of teddy bear. And I was just about to, um, I saw a doll I rather liked, just about to take it. When suddenly, from above, I looked up, and there was Queen Mary, it was quite um, alarming looking actually. She always wore rather old fashioned clothes and covered in jewellery. And she, just as I was about to take the doll, she said, Anne, can I give you a piece of advice? Well, I didn't want a piece of advice at all, I wanted the doll. But anyway, she said, often uh, better things come in little boxes. So I had to take this little box. And in fact, she was quite right, because uh, in it was a little necklace of pearls and coral. And my great-granddaughter uh, wore it at Christmas this year. It's something that, you know, we've always kept. So anyway, that's the f f sort of I'm just telling a little about the first time I met Princess Margaret. Well, that's quite the story. Um, and, and how <laughs> do you sorry, think... I, I did. You press my button and off I go. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did say this before. Yeah, yeah, I am going to come back to as often as I can. No, but... Um, no, no, I'm sure you've got wonderful questions for me. And, and, uh, and how do you think that um, personality of Princess Margaret has evolved from that age of three? Well, I think uh, I was very interesting because the Queen was six years older than her uh, and always much taller. Princess Margaret minded frightfully being small. And that's why, in fact, she didn't like Queen Mary all that much. Because every time Queen Mary saw her, she'd say, oh, Margaret, I see you haven't grown. And poor Princess Margaret. Uh, and I think it must be very difficult because 
Um, right at the beginning, uh, there's been some lovely film, I don't know if any of you have seen it, came out last week, I think, private film of the Queen, uh, of, of her childhood and then later on. And I think that when Princess Margaret realised her sister was going to be Queen, when Uncle David gone, um, it was very diff difficult for her because the Queen had everything, you know. And I remember at, well, I go into the coronation perhaps uh, in a little bit because I, I'm a very rare creature. There are very, very few people as old as me that are alive today who were part of the coronation. In fact, there was um, six um, maids of honour, I was one of them. Uh, there were some page boys who are still alive and some choir boys and the Queen, of course. Um, so, what would you like me to say next? <laughs> well, I, I suppose one of these questions is actually about the coronation, so I suppose if you can talk more about that, and perhaps also about how you expect the next coronation to look like. Yes, right. Well, I was very, like, I've, I've always worked all my life. Um, my mother started uh, ceramics, a pottery business at Holcomb. Um, partly because she didn't um, think that my sister and I should go and work in London, and also to, to uh, provide um, jobs uh, which were well, scarce in North Norfolk. Um, anyway, she started this pottery, which became a huge success. At one point, we uh, employed um, 100 um, workers there. We were the largest light in industry in North Norfolk. Um, anyway, I, my sister was rather, uh, she, she did a lot of the painting and was artistic. I wasn't, and my job was something that you've probably never heard of, but it's called f sponging and fettling. It was the most boring job in the world, that's all I can tell you. And I got rather sort of fed up, I think, by it. And my mother said, well, Anne, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I love selling. And so I went on the road, I was just 17, uh, there were no other women doing this, and I used to stay in travelling salesman hotels all around England, and they were always a bit surprised to see me, and, uh, but they all actually turned out very, very nice. And in the evening, when the trolley came round with, with uh, the cocoa or tea, um, they always turned to me and said, will you be mother? So, you know, and I had a great time there, and then I went to America to sell, didn't have great success, and while I was in America, I got a telegram. And in those days, telegrams were only sent when somebody died. And I thought, oh heavens, you know, someone has died in the family. Opened the telegram. And it said, um, come back, Anne. You've been asked to be a maid of honor at the coronation. So I was simply thrilled. And it got into the New York Times that I was there. And of course, um, wonderful, I sold dozens of uh, Toby Jugs for the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, and I uh, came back with a sort of full order book. And um, th th it was uh, extraordinary because we, um, there were six of us, we were chosen, um, it was all sort of snobby to say really nowadays, but we had to be daughters of uh, dukes, marquises or earls. We had to have um, sort of nice figures and look okay. And um, we were drilled like soldiers by the Duke of Norfolk. Um, we had lots of re re um, rehearsals, and the Duchess of Norfolk stood in for the Queen. We only had one um, rehearsal with the Queen, and that was at Buckingham Palace uh, when she sort of tied a, a, a curtain to her waist, and we sort of trailed up and down behind her. Um, and then the great day, well, we then were fitted for our dresses. And because I was brought up in the war, um, there were coupons. I mean, we, none of us had any clothes. Uh, it was rationing. I mean, I, all my childhood, I was hungry, I remember, and cold. I mean, when people complain now about certain things, I say, well, I, you know, you ought to see what we, we put up with in the war. Um, and so suddenly, we went to Norman Hartnell, who was doing the dresses, and the, the silk, for the Queen's dress and my dress 
was um, made by silkworms in Wales. For some reason, all the silkworms happened to be in Wales. Anyway, it, the, and a lot of people had saved up their coupons to give to the Queen so that she should have enough for her dress. And the same thing happened to the six of us. We were given a lot of coupons. And they were the most beautiful dresses. Ours are very heavily embroidered and very em embroidered down the back because they were seen from the back. So anyway, the great day arrived and my mother had been chosen and asked to be a lady in waiting to the Queen. So um, we were both um, staying for the night in my uncle's flat in London. The whole of London was absolutely full. You couldn't get a, you know, any, in anywhere. And Jack Cook said, well, you can have my flat. The only trouble is he's only got one bedroom. So my mother obviously had the bed, and I had a, um, a mattress on the floor, so I didn't sleep all that much. And it was pouring with rain, and I remember waking up and seeing our dresses so hanging, and I sort of thought, you know, today I'm going to wear this at this amazing occasion. And then the four of us were driven to the Abbey, and as we drove, uh, I mean, people were shouting, they'd been there all night, and soaking wet, and they kept on saying, Hillary, Hillary. And I thought, what on earth are they shouting? And of course, it was Hillary had reached the top of Mount Everest that morning. I don't quite know what, where he'd been the night before, whether he'd been in a sort of small tent waiting for the moment. But anyway, it was very, very exciting that he'd reached the top of Mount Everest. And then we arrived at the Abbey, and four of us, two, two of the grandest maids of honour, were in a in a coach behind the Queen. We were at the door and suddenly we had our coming and uh, we could hear this roar of people uh, and nearer and nearer and then round the corner came this golden coach which of course we all saw the other day at the Jubilee. Um, they, they had it in the procession and we hadn't seen, nobody had seen her in her dress and two pages opened the door and we looked at her, and she was wonderful. I mean, she was 26, she was so beautiful. Wonderful skin and eyes and all this amazing jewellery. Um, and her dress was embroidered with all the symbols of Great Britain and the Commonwealth. Um, people said, did she say anything to you uh, at that moment? Well, she didn't. We got her out of the coach, and the train um, rippled over our hands. And the great thing about that coronation day, was everywhere the Queen went, we had to go, we were sort of t attached to her room. Anyway, we went in and she stood there waiting. The Duke of Norfolk had thought of everything and put a tiny little piece of cotton on the carpet so she knew exactly where to stand. And she had our back to us and we were standing there. And then she just looked round, she looked suddenly round and she said, ready girls? And off we went to Nimrod and it was, incredible. People say, but how do they get so many people in Westminster Abbey? Well, they built the whole thing, I mean, much, much higher than this, right up to the ceiling. And as we came in, the, all the members of the Commonwealth, representing the Commonwealth, were in the choir stalls. And they were all in their national dress, looking amazing. Then you had all the peeresses and the peers. And it, uh, to me, it looked like a sort of medieval tapestry. And then the Queen, you see, originally, at the beginning, hadn't wanted, didn't want it to be televised or, or photographed. She said it was a holy occasion and that she didn't want the cameras. But uh, Winston Churchill said that, you know, because of the Commonwealth and because of the television, it was a, it was a, it was a, I, I, you would have laughed, because you're all much, much younger than me here. Uh, the televisions were this size, they were like, postage stamps and, and uh, sort of grey and white. There was only one programme every night. We used to sit waiting. We had, there was a sort of card on it. We, and we all sat for hours waiting. And anyway, um, Churchill said, no, um, because of the Commonwealth, it must be televised. So the lights were very, very strong. And we were all made up very you know, strongly. So that, because otherwise the lights would bleach the colour out of one. And the only moment of the coronation, which was the most uh, moving of all, was the anointing. The cameras were switched off. 
all her regalia was taken from her, the orb and scepter and everything was taken from her, and she was dressed in a little, um, uh, it was a, a, a little white cotton gown, actually. And the um, Marquis of Chumley, who was the most beautiful looking man, w was meant to do it up at the back. Well, he'd never dressed anybody else, let alone himself, I don't think. And he simply couldn't do it. The Duke of Norfolk got more and more irritated and said, you know, hook. And in the end, he said, well, I can see we can't have hooks and eyes. We'll have to have press studs. So this is what happened. And of course, I could see the Queen doing this <laughs> every time. <laughs> and afterwards, I said to her, ma'am, was that all right? And she said, no, it was not all right. She said, it was very, very uncomfortable. And he pressed very hard. Anyway, there she was, dressed in this beautiful... And then they anointed her, and they put a canopy over her. And as a maid of honour, the six maids of honour, we were standing, and we, we and the bishops, and I think the Duke of Edinburgh, the only people actually saw her anointed. And that was the, mo that was the religious kernel of the whole thing. And when people say, will she abdicate for Prince Charles or anything, she won't, unless something really awful happens to her. Because she gave her word, her oath, to, to the Commonwealth, to Great Britain, that she would, you know, do everything in her power as Queen to be a proper Queen. And I think, um, I don't know if you agree, but I, I, I think she's absolutely fantastic. Anyway, we then um, went behind the rude screen where her, her train was changed. She then came down with another train, slightly lighter actually. And uh, I watch the films now, and although I know it's going to be all right, I always think, oh, are we going to trip? Oh, because he had to come down steps much longer than this, like theirs, without looking. We weren't allowed to look, uh, and we just had to feel the steps, you know. Anyway, it all went fine. We then had lunch in the um, uh, there was a sort of place down below, and no guesses what we had. We had coronation chicken, and I think she had fish, actually. She had so, and then off she went in her coach to get back to Buckingham Palace, and uh, four of us went straight to Buckingham Palace, where we were so lucky because we saw Churchill coming, we saw the amazing uh, Queen of Tonga, who had refused to put down, it's pouring with rain, the cover of her thing, so she's absolutely soaking wet, and when she came out, she sort of shook herself like a dog. I remember the Queen looking sort of all amazed, uh, this huge, huge lady sort of shaking all the rain off her. And then the Queen took her crown off when we got in and put it on a table, and then she thanked us. She said, you know, thank you so much for, you know, it's been incredible, nothing went wrong. Um, and Prince Charles made a beeline for the crown, and I think it was my mother who got it away from him, because we thought it was too awful if he dropped it, you know, bad omen. Anyway, uh, and they were having a lovely time, Princess Anne and Prince Charles, they were under her train, they were sort of, and she was just laughing, and you know, it was so lovely. And then we all went along the passage, and she, she sort of ran in a way. And um, long afterwards, I saw a private film that she had made, um, of various things, and there was she looking happy, and us, and the Queen Mother looking wonderful, as she always did, and the Duke of Edinburgh, and then behind them, Princess Margaret, looking really sad. And I said to her, I I've seen this film, ma'am, well, what, you look so sad. And she said, yes, of course I was, because I lost my beloved father, they were very close, and I really lost my sister, because she's going to be so busy. And I've got to go and live with my mother, <laughs> which, uh, which I suppose, you know, was difficult at her age. But anyway, um, then the, the only other thing, I suppose, that was fantastic at the coronation was coming out on the balcony. And, of course, we, we obviously came with her because we, had to, we were with the train. And the, um, I think because we'd been through the war, we'd won the war, this was a wonderful, beautiful... Um, you know, a new Elizabethan queen. And the crowds, well, they always are, I saw the other day, but they were all people in their army or naval or air force dress, so it was rather a, not a colourful crowd. And of course they cheered and cheered, and every time she tried to go in, 
uh, that they wouldn't let her, you know, they said, oh no, you know, and we turned back and all that. And then um, my life, I, in the evening, I got a friend and I went um, down uh, in front of the, the balcony. I thought earlier on in the day I was on the balcony with her and now I'm shouting and waving and, you know, and she came out after dinner, I think two or three times. But um, I suppose it was one of the most wonderful and extraordinary moments, days of my life and I'm so, so lucky to have been part of it. And I'm now, very, I read a book when I, I was 87, I'm going to be 90 uh, uh, next month, um, and I thought, well, I can't possibly write a book. Anyway, I, I did, and I don't know if any of you read it, but it was a great success. Um, and what, one of the things I think that people like, and I ha have had letters from eminent people saying that it's a sort of key here, that I was actually there, and I'm the only person to have written about the coronation that was part of it. And I think that, because we may go on to things like the crown in a minute, might we not? <laughs> and, uh, you know, in comparison, I was there, this is absolutely true what I wrote, you know? Well, I mean, <laughs> that, that, that's certainly quite the story. Well, I, I'm not letting you get a word in edgeways, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, it's perfectly fun. You'll carry on. I mean, now. you are a figure of history, and I think it'd be great to hear more about the coronation. Um, you, you, you mentioned in um, your, um, your remarks about how Her Majesty the Queen um, actually swore an oath to the Commonwealth, yeah, and she yes. did so, I think, on a colonial tour when she was still the Princess Elizabeth. Um, you know, obviously, yeah, yeah. since her coronation, the UK seen quite a bit, she's seen quite a bit, decolonization, complete changes to society, um, certainly lots of trials and tribulations. So what do you think drives the Queen to go through these 70 years of service? Well, I think, I mean, I, I remember her as a child, she was, she's very calm, the Queen, she accepts things. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that really affected her was Uncle David. Well, she adored her Uncle David, the Prince of Wales, and there was a very charming, again, the other day, there was sort of home movies of her and Uncle David, and uh, he was playing with them, they, they seemed so, sort of, you know, fond of each other. And I think it was the most appalling blow when he gave everything up and abdicated, which meant that her beloved father, who had this really bad stutter, and he found it very, very difficult to communicate because my father was his query. The amount of times my father was fishing the waste paper basket you know, that had been kicked. I mean, the trouble was that he had um, a difficult temper in a way, it, only because he couldn't express himself. And I think the Queen at a very early age realised, you know, in fact, Uncle David abdicating was the reason her father died so early. And I think even as a small girl, after Uncle David had gone, she just swore to herself, if I am queen, when, when I become queen, I'm never going to behave like that. And I will give my life, which she has done, you know, to the country and the Commonwealth. Well, I mean, it's certainly quite a remarkable story as we celebrate 70 years of her service um, to the Crown. Um, could you talk perhaps more about your relationship to Her Royal Highness the Countess of Snowdon, better known as, you know, Princess Margaret, namely because you served as her lady-in-waiting for 31 years. Could you just talk about that and what has happened? Yes, on? I would say but quite often the royal family, when they see a friend having a bit of a difficult time, perhaps with their husbands, uh, or that, um, they, they often, quite often ask them, uh, for instance, um, uh, um, Diana, Princess of Wales' grandmother, was a, um, a lady-in-waiting to the Queen Mother because her husband, Jack Spencer, was really very difficult. Uh, and my husband wasn't easy, but the trouble was that when, my daughter's there, so I better be careful, uh, the, the, the trouble was that, um, um, it, it, when, when I was asked to be a lady in waiting, Colin thought he could come too. And I said, well, that, that's not the point. I'm afraid you can't, you know. But there were occasions, and I will tell you, you might not think it funny, but, but there was an occasion when he had come with us. And, of course, Princess Margaret, when you're a lady in waiting, 
the job of a lady in waiting is uh, to just to be there to make it easy to be a go between, really. And people come to you and say, you know, would Princess Maura like this or that? And we, the first time I ever went abroad with her was to Australia. And it was just when our marriage was going not very, going rather well. And the press there, the media, they were really difficult and shouting at her, where's Tony and all this sort of thing. And she got quite upset. So I said to her private secretary, do you think, because you were travelling by train, do you think if we had a cocktail party on the train and asked the media and she could meet them informally? And Princess Margaret actually was very good with men, she liked men. Well, it was a huge success. They came, she talked to them all, they, they thought she was wonderful. We had no more trouble there. But when we got to Sydney, they wanted her to, to go on Bondi Beach. And she said, no, I can't, Anne, I hate sand in my shoes. You know? So they came to me and said, do you think, Lady Glencona, you could persuade her? So I said, well, I'll try. I, I'm not going to promise anything. But I went up to her maid so, and said, could I have a flat pair of Princess Margaret's shoes that I put in my bag? And as we got near Bondi Beach, she was going to view it from afar. I said to her, ma'am, you know, they really want, it's rather like kissing the Blarney Stone, you know, they really would love you to go on the beach. So she said, oh, I can't, Anne, you know, my shoes. So I said, well, actually, ma'am, I have got a flat pair. And she looked at me, she said, okay, Anne, you win this time. You know, <laughs> we, we had a very nice sort of relationship like that. And um, then I remember being at the races in, in Australia, and it's pouring with rain, her shoes absolutely soaked. So she gave them to me and said, can you get somebody to dry them because, uh, and while we have lunch? And I went back to the ladies' room to fetch them, and they were unrecognisable. And I said to the lady in charge, well, you know, what's happened to them? Oh, she said, I put them in the microwave. <laughs> and so they were completely... I mean, anyway, she had to wear them because we didn't have any other shoes. She hobbled around, glaring at me. But um, the thing about her was that as a lady in waiting, you would do a lot of letters and organising and, uh, you know, you always have to find out where the lavatory is and they ask what she'd like to drink. But in the evenings, uh, when, you know, uh, all that's over, um, I used to go to her sitting room and we used to talk about, you know, who, who she'd met, what she'd done, what she thought, laugh a bit, you know, um, and relax. And so that's really what a lady in waiting does. All right, well, let's perhaps then broaden this about perhaps other royal experiences. So, of course, you served for many years um, as a part of the royal household and the monarchy. So how do you think the functioning of the royal household has changed over the past 70 years? Um, will it survive? How should it survive? And what do you think are the yeah, biggest threats I think to it? When you talk about households, you see there's several households. And that, that, I think, is the problem slightly. There's Buckingham Palace household. Prince Charles has a household. Prince Andrew had a household, you know, uh, and uh, th th they all vie slightly with each other. I, 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 actually, Princess Margaret's household, we were all very, very friendly and got on very well. Princess Margaret was really good with everybody who worked for her, and um, her staff uh, stayed with her, her dressers, uh, sort of lay, uh, people who look after her clothes and, and, and her, uh, always stayed with her. I think that um, things are changing, obviously now. The Queen uh, isn't, can't do so much, you know. Um, and Prince Charles is obviously being given much more to do. Um, I think Prince Charles will have, I think, it's interesting, I'm very fond of Prince Charles. He's a great friend of mine. I've known him since he was a little boy. He used to come to Holcombe uh, when he, if he ever had mumps or measles or anything like that, because the Queen never been to boarding, she's never been to school. And so in order to protect her, Prince Charles used to be sent up and my mother used to look after him. So I've known him, you know, and I'm really fond of him. And so much of what he said about the environment and all that sort of thing has come true. People used to laugh at him, you know. Um, but he is outspoken. And of course, when you, when he becomes king, and this is what the Queen has been so brilliant at, she has always kept her own personal thoughts to herself. Prince Charles will have, I think, to quickly learn this, 
you know, uh, um, he knows, but he, but he finds it so difficult. Having always spoken his mind, suddenly he will not be able to. People sometimes say, what about Prince William? What, why, why doesn't Prince William become king? Well, I don't think, I think the Queen would want, Prince Charles has waited long enough, and I think that he will be a very good king. He works terribly hard, Prince Charles, and he's, you know, all his charities and, uh, have been amazing, actually. I mean, he, do, he does so much good work. Well, I think um, on the topic of Prince Charles, I suppose I'll move on to the dreaded question. Well, so. I may not answer it. <laughs> what, 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 what's well, he going to be? No, so um, I'm going to talk about the public perception of the royal family. So in recent years, I'm sure we're familiar, there's been the TV show The Crown, oh, which oh, of yes, course, right. it's this question. No, 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 um, I thought you were, yeah, I thought you were um, going down another alleyway. No, I'll talk about The Crown. Yeah, yeah but um, <laughs> it, it very much has played, I think, an outsized role in yeah. how um, people have seen the royal family. So from your experience and from your opinion, how do you think the media has represented the royal family and what do you think are well, the consequences the crown, of that? Well, I think the crown, I saw the very first, I don't know if you, you did too, and I thought it was rather good. Where we, we had, the maids of honor had a private showing because it was about the coronation, the first thing. But then I think it's gone completely off piste and, and it's sort of ridiculous because um, I was in it for a very short time. They, they filmed, uh, the, the moment when we introduced um, Princess Margaret to Roddy Llewellyn. Um, and I, I hope they might do it um, at our family home in Scotland, but anyway, they couldn't do that. And so they did it in a sort of awful, seedy looking sort of country club. And Princess Margaret and I are, are, are dressed in bikinis, and I'm pimping for her. I'm saying, ma'am, do you like that young man over there? He's got a sort of cute bottom. Well, I mean, of course nothing like that happened. I mean, completely mad. Uh, but the people in America think it's true. And that's the trouble, and I think that they should have a warning, like the books or something nowadays have to have warnings, uh, saying that, you know, there's a lot, most of it is completely made up. And they're really, really difficult about with Prince Charles. I feel really sorry the way they depict him. Uh, one or two things were very good. Claire Foy was brilliant as a queen, I thought. Um, but on the whole, um, it's, not, it's just not true. And how do you think the royal family can perhaps respond to how the media is shaping their image? Well, they can't. I mean, they don't watch it to begin with. I mean, there's no point them watching it because it would upset them. I mean, I don't, I don't watch it either because it upsets me so much. Um, they can't really. I mean, the Queen has had the most marvellous press actually for the Jubilee. I mean, wonderful things have been written about her quite rightly. And she has sort of remained above although she's had to try and deal with all the difficult things that have happened recently. But um, I, I've got great hope. I live quite near Prince William and the, the Kate, the, the, uh, the Cambridge, and, and they're great. I, she is extraordinary, she's wonderful. And I think they're a real safe pair of hands. And um, you won't perhaps talk about the ones who've gone to America. <laughs> Well. <laughs> well, I mean, I was sad because they were greeted at the wedding and was so wonderful, everybody was so pleased. I mean, they couldn't have had a more lovely wedding. Uh, but of course, it's not, being a member of the royal family isn't that. It's not a soap opera. It's not, um, you know, it's jolly hard work, actually. And if she, you, you think you're going to, you know, drive around in a coach and just be sort of, uh, have a, a wonderful time and I, I think she just re realized that it wasn't going to be like that and being a film actress I think she just wanted to go back to something she knew. Well I suppose we can move on to what you have done um, with respect to depicting the royal families. You said one of the reasons that you wrote your book was that you thought you thought there were some horrible things that were said about. Oh, yeah. Yes Margaret. I did. I, I, I really minded some of the books that were written about Princess Margaret. There's a horrible one called Ma'am Darling. Completely made up. They, they said she'd seek to be married to Salvador Dali. You know, I mean, honestly. Uh, and those sort of things, it's completely not true at all. And I thought I'd like to put the record straight because she was a really wonderful friend to me. And when my second son got AIDS um, in the 80s, um, everybody's really, really frightened. We didn't know how it was called. He had married and had a little son and then he decided that he wanted to come out. And anyway, I said, look, you've got to be very careful because we don't know how this 
is called. He wasn't careful enough. And um, Princess Margaret was wonderful. She used to come to me, there's a place in London called the Lighthouse, where all the young men, because there were so many young men, their partners had died, their parents wouldn't have anything to do with them. And they lived there. And uh, unlike Diana, who came with the sort of posse of photographers, we, we, nobody knew Princess Margaret came, and long before Diana. And uh, she wasn't so touchy-feely, but she used to sit in our room, she'd joke with them and they'd laugh. And um, she's always ringing me up and saying, you know, oh, she'd heard something, there might be a cure. She always brought her children, David and Sarah, to stay with, with me. A lot of my friends suddenly didn't. I mean, I didn't blame them because, you know. And uh, uh, whenever she saw Henry, she hugged him. She came to his funeral and she was just a really good friend. Um, and with, with my other uh, children, my eldest son was a drug addict. He actually um, did get married and I've got a wonderful grandson who's now, um, he's a banker and a lawyer and he's about to get married. Um, Charlie would, be, would have been so surprised if, if he'd known. Um, so, you know, and Princess Margaret all the way through my life um, was a really good friend. So when she was ill, she couldn't, she went blind, you know, at the end, for about two years. And one or two, uh, her best, she, she rather touchingly, because she was, loved men, and she was so good with men. But when she became ill, she, she didn't look too good. And so she said to me, <clears throat> and I'm afraid I'm giving up men now. <laughs> she said, but I'd love to see all my, all my uh, girlfriends, women friends. And I used to go and read to her. And I remember arriving one day, so she said, I'm quite excited. I've got this book on seeds. So my heart sank. I thought, oh God. So, so anyway, off I started. Got as far as potatoes, I think. And I said, are you enjoying this, ma'am? Are, are you sure? Yes, she said. Roddy gave it to me. Carry on. So, so off I carried on, you know. But, but um, you know, I, I, I miss her even now. She, she was very extraordinary because... When you asked her a question, I often said, rang her up, especially when the boys were ill, because Christopher, my third son, had his, was in a, had his motorbike accident in Belize, was in a coma for five months, and she's wonderful there. Um, but she often, her advice came from a different way, not, not the way that one expected or what other people might say. She, she's a very clever Princess Margaret. I mean, she used to love coming here to Oxford and we used to go around all the colleges and Cambridge um, and she, very interested in the church. Um, I used to hear her putting some of the bishops were amazed by her, you know, her questions. I mean, I think she would have loved to have come to university. Because you see, in our day, in my day, there's no question of one coming to university. You, you expected to marry, have a husband. Um, and, um, you know, we were, in fact, girls were not educated in my day at all, really. And um, the Queen was, because um, Queen Mary, um, said to Queen Elizabeth, because Queen Elizabeth just wanted them to have fun, you know, and all that sort of thing. And Queen Mary said, no, they've got to be educated properly, especially Princess Elizabeth. And so Princess Elizabeth had people um, um, from Oxford that came and taught her, and Cambridge, and Eton, and she's very well educated, the Queen. But Princess Margaret was furious, because she wasn't. She had a a French governess, and Crawfee, which was her governess. But I'm sure that if in our days, I'm sure Princess Margaret would have loved to have come to university like all you lucky people here. All right. Well, you actually mentioned um, Princess Diana, and there has been quite a bit of discussion about how people like Princess Diana, but also the one who went to America, the Duchess of Sussex, have kind of leaned <laughs> well, in, talk about yeah. <laughs> have leaned into celebrity culture. So do you think there has been an amalgamation of the royal with a celebrity? Yes, I think, well, they, they, I mean, because Diana, I knew her as a child, Diana, I knew her when she was three. She used to go to my sister's, um, had a little school, little preschool. Um, I've always known her. And, of course, I mean, she's brought up, um, Diana, on sounding a state with the royal family. And when you get these ridiculous things again in the Crown, or one of those things, where, where 
they, uh, Princess Morgan has to teach her to curtsy. Well, I mean, that's ridiculous. She, I mean, she's brought up with them, you know. Um, but, of course, what she did, which was unexpected, I mean, she just took the world by storm. I mean, she was, uh, she, she was great. She was beautiful looking. She had this wonderful way with people, especially people who are not well. Um, and I think that it's quite difficult for, for Prince Charles because they always used to shout for her and be very disappointed because um, they, uh, with the royal couples like William and Kate, you, you do each side uh, of the crowd, you see. And of course, Diana, Prince Charles was this side, and they were all shouting, come over here. <laughs> and I think that was very difficult because he wasn't used to that, you know. And also, he was much older than her. Um, and, I mean, she's so young, she was only 19. And he told me just one little story, I'm not too indiscreet, but, but um, he, I, I was talking about his honeymoon, actually. And uh, he said they were going on the Britannia. And he said, you see, the thing was, I had a pile of books I wanted to read. And I couldn't understand it because Diana spent the whole time with the crew. Well, you know, I didn't sort of say, well, maybe she would have wanted to, you know, she's so young, she wanted a bit of fun. But um, I think that, um, but I mean, the, the great good thing was that they, they had two lovely boys. And then it just didn't go. It just wasn't meant, I don't think, really. Which is sad. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I guess, suppose, to many people, a great tragedy. Um, of course, this year marks the 70th anniversary of Queen Elizabeth II's coronation. Um, I'm going to ask you about her legacy. It is next year. Uh, the next year, okay, yeah, 1953, <laughs> no, that's right. People always think it's yeah. the, the anniversary of the coronation this year, it isn't, it's next year. But the reason was that when she became queen, Churchill said, we cannot have the coronation too soon, you know, because of rationing and, you know, we've got to have one more year to try and get the whole thing together. So, in fact, it's next year that we celebrate the coronation. Yes, well, I suppose her ascension <laughs> to the throne would be the accurate description <laughs> yes, here. Exactly. I do apologize no, no, for no, this. No, 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 and I didn't want to catch you out in that <laughs> no, rather no, rude think, fashion. <laughs> look, this, we are an educational institution. It's good to know the facts. I believe the coronation was, in fact, in 1953. I did... Um, that that was, a, that was a small oversight for me. Yeah. Um, but I suppose 70 years from now, um, how do you think Queen Elizabeth will be remembered? Well, I think she'll be remembered in a very good way. People are already starting to sort of talk. Um, she, she's extraordinary because, well, partly because of the length, I suppose. I mean, most of us, including me, she's always been there. She's always been queen. I mean, what we're all going to do slightly when she goes, I, you know, really, really sad. And she has been amazing. I mean, uh, you know, she has never really put a foot wrong, even when the moment, you know, when she didn't come down to London after Diana died. Um, it, the reason, which I think was a very good reason, she said, I must stay with my grandchildren. I mean, they need me. Perhaps everybody else needs me, but I was, you know, and she stayed up there for a few days and then eventually did come down when she made that very touching speech. Um, I think she'll be remembered as one of the really great monarchs of Great Britain. And the same question about Princess Margaret. How will she be remembered? Well, in a rather different way. I mean, I hope what, one of the nice things, one of the unexpected things of writing my book, were all the wonderful letters I get from people. I get um, them from people who've lost children, uh, of her various reasons. I get uh, people write who've got difficult husbands, difficult wives. Um, and the other very encouraging letters people write and say, we never bothered with Princess Margaret, really. But since your book, um, we've seen it in a completely different light. And so I, I'm really, really pleased about that. I've able to make, uh, at least put my feelings about her, um, which wouldn't have, I don't think anybody else would have written like that about her. And I was a bit worried, of course, after I'd written my book, um, and felt I couldn't send one to the Queen, I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> so I knew uh, Princess, Prince Charles liked it. Anyway, I heard the other day from Fergie, who, Prince Andrew's ex-wife, that the Queen was talking about me. So I, was, I thought, oh my God, what, what she say? Oh, folks said, no, no, she's talking about your book, saying how much she enjoyed, how much it made her laugh. So I then sent her a signed copy, saying, I'm so glad, Mum, I hear you like my book. <laughs>
Um, and before I hand you over to a few audience questions, yes. um, this is a question that we, I think, asked every single speaker oh, that right. come this term. Uh, what is that? What advice would you give to the members of the Oxford Union? To the world, to who? Uh, to, to, to the members of the Oxford Union. So to the, um, to the audience members here. Uh, what advice? What, what to students? Yes, to, to the students of Oxford. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, one gets very confused, I do, when I read about snowflakes and, you know, all these wonderful books on that have to have warnings in them and all that sort of thing. Um, perhaps it's not true. I don't know whether it's true. I'm sure you're all very stored here. But I do think that people should uh, sort of, you know, uh, I know a stiff upper lip is not, is not um, very popular nowadays, but I think a bit more backbone. I really do. And, you know, um, people can seem to complain about everything. Uh, so, uh, t you know, very small things. Um, and I, I, I think that now people have so much. I mean, when I was young, um, well, it was a war. But, but, you know, it was really, really difficult, uh, you know. Uh, I mean, there was, as for heating, there was no heating at all. Uh, my bedroom in the winter was, had ice on the inside, and I used to put my clothes at the back bottom of the bed, you know, and, and dress in the bed and all that. I mean, you know, we all did that. And, we all, uh, and I just think people perhaps have too much nowadays. There's so much uh, of things to do and things they want and... and uh, I, 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 do you think I'm right in a way? I think that people, <laughs> you're not at all sure, I can see. <laughs> well, but, I, but I think I people agree. should be a bit, you know, a bit tougher. That's my thing. But then I'm going to be 90 next month, so I, I, perhaps that's just coming from me. Well, I certainly think that is a perspective that's worth considering for everybody. Oh, good. Well, thank so, you very much. Um, I think it's time to open it up to the audience. Are there any questions? I'm sure there are a few. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps nobody wants to. They probably had enough from me, I should say. <laughs> no, well, if there's not. Anyway, your, your lovely audience, thank you very much for coming. I mean, really nice okay, speaking Okay, actually, question too. to the lady. I'd like to know what's your Hold off the microphone, please, thank you. Yeah. Okay, can you repeat it for me in case I can't? Yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Hello, Lady Glen Connor. I'd like to know what is your favorite place on the Holcomb Estate? Your favorite? Place on the Holcomb Estate. Um, your favorite place on the what estate? Holcomb. Oh, favorite place is Holcomb. Well, that's sort of easy, really. In a way, it's the beach. Um, I just I, I had so many happy times on the beach, you know. And when I was young, wonderful picnics, and uh, we used to camp there, and uh, and all the birds on the marshes, you know. But um, I used to love my father loved wildlife and birds and we used to go into the hide. We had a hide and I remember frightfully exciting when we heard the bitten booming, you know, we suddenly heard it. Um, I, th I suppose, and inside, I suppose at Holcomb, the Marble Hall. I used to have such fun in the Marble Hall. It's got so many memories. I was, um, I was held there by my father, grandfather and great-grandfather, all looking furious at me for being a girl. And then I came out there in my dress, I, because again, there were no coupons, I think, and somebody from the uh, American Air Drove gave my mother a parachute, which uh, we dyed and cut. So I, I sort of came out in those days, that was girls being presented, really, uh, in a parachute dress, and then I stood there uh, in my wedding dress. So I think the marble hall inside and the beach outside. Very well. Question over there. Mm -hmm. Well, can you come? Because I, uh, Hi, uh, being 90, my hearing isn't no, uh, as quite as good as it was. Um, yeah. If you'd had the opportunity when you were younger to go to university, what would you have studied? Oh, I think history. If I, if I, 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 don't, I wouldn't have been clever enough, I don't think, to come to, to university. I, I would have loved to have you know, have the chance. Yes, I would have read history. Very well. Any further questions? Mm. Oh, Over there. lovely gentleman down there. Asking, asking, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, could I ask, one person who you didn't mention as much was Prince Philip. Do you have any memories or, or, or recollections of him that, 
Uh, Prince Philip. Uh, Prince Philip, yeah. yes. Well, um, I, well, I'll tell you, I mean, we, as Maison, we all fell in love with Prince Philip at the coronation. He was so handsome, but a little bit fussy. He wanted to make it all, um, uh, you know, I think to make the day for her perfect. But there was one incident. He'd wanted Baron, who was his great friend, to take the photographs. And Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mother, said, no, no, no we've got to have Cecil Beaton. And um, I remember we were all lined up. You've probably seen the photograph. And the Duke of Edinburgh was being quite sort of fussy with us and making us stand. And Cecil Beaton got more I irritated. He suddenly put the camera down looked at Prince Philip and said, do you want to take the photographs, sir? So Prince Philip, uh, and Queen looked absolutely horrified. Anyway, he did shuffle off, we didn't see him. But the, uh, and the other story was when they came, the Queen and Prince Philip came to Mustique, the island that my husband, we didn't have time to speak, speak about that. Um, and they came to see Princess Margaret's house because we gave her a plot of land for her wedding present. And uh, she, uh, with the help of Colin, had built her house. It was the only thing she owned. And the Queen and Prince Philip were doing a tour of the Caribbean and came ashore. And um, Colin's mother, who was very eccentric, we asked her to go and get, buy some clothes in England for the people in the village, because we couldn't get anything. Anyway, she arrived with all these boxes, and we absolutely thrilled and opened them. She bought a job lot of Victorian clothes. So we had to say to the people in the village, this is what you wear when the Queen comes. It's the wrong reign, I'm afraid, but anyway. And the, the Queen looked at all these people as she came up and she turned to Princess Margaret at the top and she said, Margaret, I had no idea Mustique was in a, in a Victorian time walk. So Mrs. <laughs> Margaret said, well, it's not actually, it's Colin's mother who, who bought. And anyway, the Duke of Edinburgh, when he landed, he looked round and he was inclined to say this. He said to Colin, I can see you've ruined this island. Poor Colin was very dashed. So I said slightly, which is true, but she, he didn't rather. I said, well, sir, we've got a great treat for you. We've arranged for you to swim with sharks. And being Prince Philip, of course, he, he took, took that, absolutely. Well, in fact, it was a very rare thing that happened in one of the bays. The mother sharks come in to give birth, and something actually enjoyed. And when he left, he said to Colin, I, I think your island's great. I mean, I mean, he's wonderful with the Queen, you know. He was always, uh, he made her laugh a lot. The Queen, actually, is very funny. The Queen's got a marvellous sense of humour. I, I've got a photograph of her with a bucket on her head, actually. <laughs> Well, somebody sort of made a joke of some sort, uh, and, uh, and she said, I really don't want to hear another joke, and just took this bucket and just did, put it <laughs> like that. And I, I had my camera, I didn't know if she realised I'd taken a photograph. But the, the Duke of Edinburgh, I think she, she is missing a lot, you know. He, he was, he, and he, would, he was so good when all, all the difficulty with the children and all that. You know. So... Um, he was a great mainstay, and I, I mean, she fell in love with him when she was 12, I think. And uh, any person she's ever loved, which is rather touching. Well, I believe this is all the time we have, so ladies and gentlemen, please join me <laughs> in thanking the Lady Glen Connor. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you so much.